Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Genesis Group. And hello to you, Mr. William Gerdner. It's always a pleasure to see you. I'm very happy and delighted and honored to have you here again. And uh, tonight we are going to speak about your best book, <laughs> The Trouble with Democracy. And I understand that you're going to sp speak and uh, lecture us about the... the seventh uh, chapter, Democracy and the Slaughterhouse of History. Correct? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And, so uh, please <laughs> go ahead, my friend. Thank you. And thank you for having me once again. Um, first, I should like to mention, I, I didn't mean to be too self-promotional when I told you it was, I think, my best book. Uh, I like all my books or else I wouldn't have written them. <laughs> but this one, I think, uh, goes maybe a little deeper, more philosophically and morally and politically deeper than any of the other books, although they do overlap. Um, I really recommend this book for anyone who is a serious uh, student of political philosophy. <clears throat> and while um, it's probable I've made some mistakes or errors in judgment myself, I don't think on the whole I have made a lot of them. And I think this book, uh, if it's read seriously and carefully, will startle a lot of readers because it, it, it brings us to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to be doing some throat clearing again because I'm still got this COVID thing going on. It's negative now, but it takes a while to get over it. <clears throat> At any rate, I, I'm starting with Chapter 7 because it's manageable, uh, very interesting, I think. Uh, I hope you'll agree. <laughs> and it's short. Um, this and the two chapters which follow are probably at the heart of the book in the sense in which they will startle readers who grew up probably like me, uh, thinking that the word democracy was kind of like a sacred word and the concept democracy, a say of democracy, a sort of sacred subject. Um, maybe I was just too stupid to question it as a young man, <clears throat> but I think that was true of the whole population. Um, we didn't question it. It was, it was supposedly uh, what our troops fought for when they went to Europe to fight Hitler. And, um, Hitlerism and communism and so on. But this chapter takes a leap way beyond that to discuss, uh, well, the title is Democracy and the Slaughterhouse of History. That's a pretty rough title. The subtitle is Attacking Society from Above. And uh, a little later on, assume, assuming we're still doing more of this, I will have a series of uh, talks, <clears throat> which I like to give, on attacking society from below. <clears throat> when society is attacked, I mean by that civil society, I think I've explained before that for me, uh, all of political reality is a kind of three layer uh, sandwich, so to speak. The top, and it has to do with methods of control. <clears throat> the, the top layer is the power layer. Okay, it has to do with government and the state with any form of government that can call upon police power <clears throat> to uh, enforce its will and control what it is, what it wants to control. In the middle of this uh, political sandwich, as I call it, <laughs> is uh, civil society. Now, civil society has no power, not in the sense that um, I just described uh, for the state. Uh, nobody in civil society, unless it's for a crime, can call the police to enforce what they want to do. For example, your mother or father wants to get you to do your homework and you refuse as a young man. They can't call the police and get the police to make you do your homework. Power is not an option for a civil society, but what I call authority is. And authority and power are almost indistinguishable in the sense that they can both get something done, the first with a threat, and and the second with a threat combined with shame and all the other social tools that go into getting other people to do what you want them to do. For example, when uh, parents want a child to do something, 
say the child is not not a baby anymore, but <clears throat> is simply disobeying, now the family can use its uh, considerable authority, cutting off privileges, uh, uh, using shame to embarrass the child into behaving properly, uh, all, all sorts of, um, I'm not going to call them authoritarian, but authority weapons, which parents use all the time. And so do teachers. And so do uh, preachers and priests in the church. Um, all sorts of people use authority in civil, civil society <clears throat> to achieve their objectives. But they don't use power. Uh, and that's how civil society controls itself through uh, the exercise of authority. At the very bottom layer, we have the solitary individual. <clears throat> and the solitary individual uses self-control, hopefully, <laughs> in, uh, to get through the day and get through life. Self-control is the means of control for the solitary individual, authority for communities and civil society, and power for the state. <clears throat> Now, why did I go, go into that? Uh, well, because this chapter is about um, attacking civil society from above. So the way in which power structures, especially uh, democratic power structures, as we will see, um, can, de can destroy civil society from above. And later, when we get there, I'll be talking about how individual will and the exercise of individual will, or what I call hyper-individualism, can destroy civil society from below. <clears throat> and I think we've had experience with both. Uh, in fact, the latter type is what we're seeing most frequently now. <clears throat> the um, moral elements of civil society being trashed and uh, abolished, taken apart uh, by individual will, fortified by court judgments. Anyway, we'll get to that. I'm going to read this uh, chapter and comment on it as I go, uh, because, as I say, I can't say it any more clearly than I've written it. <laughs> so here we go. Um, first, a quote from Sir Herbert Reed, who was a British philosopher and historian. Um, I should say the late Sir Herbert Reed. He said, all forms of socialism whether state socialism of the Russian kind or national socialism <clears throat> of the German kind or democratic socialism of the British kind are professedly democratic. That is to say, they all obtain popular assent by the manipulation of mass psychology. Well, when I first read that statement, I mean, I was learning a lot and <laughs> doing the research for this book. <clears throat> I was a little surprised. Here he was equating something we think of as soft British socialism with Nazism and communism. How could that be? <clears throat> well, as we go forward, we're going to see. And the second quote, which heads the chapter, is by a an, an really interesting French writer and political thinker named Bertrand, Bertrand de Juvenel. Uh, he wrote a book called On Power. And here's um, an arresting comment from his book. He says, democracy, then, in the centralizing, pattern-making, absolutist shape which we have given to it, is, it is clear, listen to this, the time of tyranny's incubation. So what he is telling us, and our first reaction is to say, no, no, that can't be so. Democracy, democracy is about liberty, about freedom, about human rights, and, you know, individual um um, self-direction <clears throat> and all that kind of thing. And he's saying that doc democracy is the time of tyranny's incubation. So I'm going to try to explain here as we go how that works. And I'm also going to say that this little bit I'm going to be speaking with you about, I haven't seen before. I'm not going to take any credit for, for originality, uh, except maybe in the way in which I've been able to pull it together from a variety of sources. So below, as I say, point by point, and in the belief that it is instructive to understand how something that, that at first seems so hopeful and unimpeachable <clears throat> can go so badly wrong, namely democracy, I have tried to isolate the general sequence of political, moral, 
and psychological steps in the movement of mind that enables the march towards totalitarian government in general, and that happened to be exhibited for the first time during the, let's call it what it was, the democracy fever of the French Revolution. Unfolded below is the deadly sequence that specifically enables those who say they are lovers of freedom to murder in the name of democracy. <laughs> Keep that in mind. That's exactly what's going on. It enables them to murder in the name of democracy. And I'm trying to explain how that seemingly impossible sequence of mental operations can be true. So it's repackaged here. I'm <laughs> sorry. It is what I'm about to say is teased both from Rousseau's revolutionary vision of democratic freedom, which we've talked about before, as expressed in his social contract, and in J.L. Talman's Origins of Totalitarian Democracy book, which I read with fascination. I mean, first of all, the two words. How can you put the word totalitarian and the word democracy together? How does that work? That's what I really wanted to know. And so this is what I'm explaining. Uh, so I've repackaged that to show the interdependence <clears throat> of these ideas. Talman's book gives a wealth of use, useful historical detail and analyses concerning the influential individuals, ideals, and political movements that compose the modern world's first attempt to create a total democracy, which was the French attempt. But it does not draw out the full architecture of the ideology, so to speak, nor does it adequately reveal the reliance of the whole system of, of totalitarian democracy on the romantic movement in the world of ideas. We haven't talked a lot about that, but we will. And uh, the work of Rousseau. Some defenders of the Marxist version of democracy have taken issue with Talman on the grounds that neither Karl Marx nor Frederick Engels, his buddy and sugar daddy, <clears throat> were totalitarian. And that charge is addressed later in this chapter as well. But I suggest that the endless bickering between experts over whether Rousseau, Marx, Hitler, and others who followed in their line were truly totalitarian or truly interested in freedom and democracy would be ended if we grasp the difference between the dream and the method. What it boils down to is that their mystical dreams about so-called true democracy, and they all had them, were and still are impossible to implement without totalitarian methods. That's a key insight here. A natural concern for us is the fact that all the Western liberal democracies have been slowly eliminating <clears throat> or weakening the wise checks and balances on their own democratic institutions. I'm sorry, and I don't want to stop at every sentence, but that sentence is telling us a lot. All the Western democracies, I'm sure it's happened in Europe, the same as in North America and Canada and Britain, have been weakening um, their own checks and balances um, on uh, democratic institutions. And, and people who grew up in praise of democracy, like I did, would say, so what's wrong with that? Why don't we just have pure democracy and the hell with all the checks and balances? And the reason is, and I think I've mentioned it before, is that there have been a ton of reasons throughout history to be almost terrified of democracy in its unshackled form. Certainly Canada's founders, who were putting Canada together in the uh, 1860s, finalizing the first constitution in 1865, uh, 67, sorry. They were thinking it through in 65. They turned to America and they said, look, look at that. There's a bloody fratricidal slaughter down there, probably in terms of body count alone. The worst war in, in modern history was the American Civil War. Fought over what? <laughs> over different, different uh, democratic rights that they couldn't agree on. Uh, so the Canadians didn't want anything to do with that. So when they put Canada together, they said, okay, the people need to have some kind of form, some kind of way of consenting to the laws that they asked the people they sent to Parliament to make. 
But other than that, we don't want the people making laws. We don't want them in parliament. We want the representatives in parliament, footnote, who are better than them, hopefully chosen to be wiser, more experienced, more grounded people who had what our founders called a stake in the country. What was the stake in the country? Well, they own land. They own property, buildings, businesses, had families here, whatever. So there's no way Canada was going to give the vote to, say, a migrant laborer or somebody passing through who just happened to be visiting the country. <laughs> no, no, they they wanted the country run by, run by people who were filtered out from the masses and who had more talents, presumably more intelligence, and more interest in a larger vision of what the country should be than the ordinary individual. So that's why we had all the checks and balances on our democracy. And those have been gradually eroded over time. Uh, same is true in America. And um, as I say, I think probably every other democracy has done the same thing. In other words, going back on their own founding history, which was a history of great, great caution when it came to mass, op mass opinion. Um, the recent calls to eliminate the American Electoral College, for example, which we saw in the last election. And I wrote this in 1999, long before we saw this recent brouhaha over that. An institution which was invented precisely to prevent um, simple majority rule is, an, is just one example. But democratic euphoria is the rule of the day. And when the time comes to make it more true, like in true democracy, there will likely be trouble once again. Even though the West has suffered repeatedly under the heavy chains of freedom, isn't that an odd thing to say? The heavy chains of freedom as forged by the dreamlanders of pure democracy, not by the rational individuals who put political systems together with an important democratic element because they believed that consent of the people to their own laws was important, <laughs> as distinct from letting them make their own laws, you know, which was not the intent in America or Canada originally. <clears throat> anyway, Rousseau was the child of Plato. Marx was the child of Rousseau. And Lenin of Marx and Stalin of Lenin. There have been many others, as I say. Pity the mothers and pity all the dead. At any rate, Talmud's work is valuable as a repository of the decisive movements and arguments that first led human beings <clears throat> from the euphoria of democratic freedom, which is still here. We see it every day. Every time I pick up the newspaper, even this morning, I saw a couple of articles on the recent freedom convoy in Canada. It's, it was a kind of euphoric experience in which they weren't examining the concept of freedom or the concept of democracy, it's way beyond that. It's gotten hyper-emotional, so that we're not even thinking about it anymore. At any rate, Talmud's work is valuable as a repository of the decisive movements and arguments that first led human beings from the euphoria of democratic freedom to its methodic opposite. Clearly, once the theoretical process of mystifying democracy, that is to say, by changing it from the voice of the real people to the voice of an ideal romanticized people, was successfully achieved by Rousseau, the iron rails of totalitarianism were swiftly laid down in the West. So what follows may be considered the universals of totalitarian democracy. They are included here as a warning to show how the mind can travel so easily from democracy to murder. Mass murder, by the way. Key concepts are italicized and occasional page numbers refer to Talmud's book for anyone who wants to create a deadly totalitarian system from beautiful democratic principles. Here is the recipe. So this part of the chapter is now titled The Universals of Totalitarian Democracy. And I started with a quote by the Frenchman Anatole France, who said, when one begins with the supposition 
that men are naturally good, naturally good and virtuous, one inevitably ends by wishing to kill them all. And the logic of that will become clear as we go forward. So the first item here, the first step in this process of setting up universals of totalitarian democracy is this. You declare an inherent human goodness. The linchpin of this entire sequence that I'm going to give you is to establish the flattering idea that the inherent goodness and inherent equality of all human beings is grounded in a natural order found in human reason. We recognize this as a secular vision of man as made in the image of God before the fall. It is a vision poised aggressively against traditional or orthodox Augustinian Christianity, which holds that only God is perfect and all humans are hopelessly flawed by original sin. This foundation argument for which democracy has served as a revolutionary political vehicle must be understood as the beginning of the modern West attack on its own civilization. Those are very, very strong words, and I intend to support them. The second step after the declaration of inherent human goodness is to assert moral autonomy. Because all men are good, government can be just only if it's based on consent and then on contract between enlightened and morally autonomous individuals who agree to overthrow social corruption and restore society to its original goodness. This is the entry point for what I call the secular millenarian transformation of the Gnostic masses. I'm sorry for the mouthful, but the book deals in depth with Gnosticism and millenarianism as they were at the root of everything I'm talking about. And that has sparked so much utopian political behavior in, in our own time. Uh, the third step is introduce, excuse the terms, compression, fusion, and a new corporate person. This step aims and leads directly to a practical need to somehow transform the many into the one so that society can be easily moved in a specific direction. Hereditary kings had originally fulfilled this need to express the wills, plural, of the many as the will of the one. <clears throat> but the moment a king is murdered or outlawed, the people require some mechanism of what I call democratic compression to create a new king from the bottom, so to speak, or from the bottom up. This normally results in proposals for the fusion, literally the fusion, of all free, morally, morally autonomous individuals into a single new corporate person who is revered as a sacred whole and a symbol greater than the sum of the parts. Presto, <clears throat> a new king. And that's exactly what Rousseau was doing in his social contract. Fourth step, dictate a general will, so-called. By the way, if those are, if any of you are interested, there's a fascinating book written by Professor Patrick Riley called The General Will Before Rousseau, in which he outlines the over 100 year history of this conception from Pascal and Malbranche in France upwards to Rousseau, who really gave it a turn. So the dictation of a general will is important. The idea at the time was that God only rules through a general will. You know, uh, he makes it rain on the earth. He doesn't make it rain on you, but not on your neighbor, because you want your crops to grow and your neighbor's holding a wedding and doesn't want it to rain. Uh, the general will is how God works, not through what he called, what uh, these people called the particular will of individuals. And the great struggle in Rousseau's social contract book was trying to show how particular wills have to be surrendered under the social contract, and everyone has to come in line with what he called a general will. Now, it's interesting that the general will, by the way, is not the sum total of everybody's vote. 
Rousseau didn't care what everybody was voting. What he cared about was that they should surrender their particular wills, their particular voting desires in the name of the general will. In other words, of what the common good of all. That's what the general will was about. It wasn't about an arithmetic sum of everybody who went to the polling booth. <laughs> he didn't care about that. That that was just the sum of particular wills. And that could be actually a gigantic national selfishness if they weren't thinking about the common good. So I hope you see what I'm getting at. <laughs> the general will was about voting for the common good, surrendering your particular will uh, for the common good. So I say part four of this step-by-step -step process here <clears throat> is dictating a general will. The newly established corporate person is, is then declared to symbolize a general will that exists like a platonic form, whether or not immediately perceived. And that can be found only by stripping away all the particular selfish interest of each citizen, which is what I was explaining uh, off the book here. <laughs> the general will, this general will is the sole truth and the correct basis for law and ultimately corresponds to the reason, capital R, reason, underlying both nature and human nature. So you see how he's putting it all together in one grand sort of political cosmology here. Theologically speaking, this mass process of purging society of selfishness is a form of group asceticism. While penitent individuals whip themselves to purge evil personal desires <clears throat> in their search for spiritual purity, whole societies can actually physically liquidate offending individuals and groups standing in the way of the process of social and democratic purification. You, you see the, you see how frightening this can be. That's exactly what happened in France. That was the process they put themselves through. And it had a kind of scary and perverse logic as it unfolded, which you can see in Talman's book and an open mind. Fifth, you have to establish a representative body because millions of citizens in large nations cannot vote directly on every law. A representative assembly of those, get this, already enlightened, <laughs> must be formed to discern what the true general will is in every circumstance. In other words, someone had to decide, had to say, no, here's the general will. It's this and it's not that. And that becomes the authoritative dictatorial body of uh, a mass democracy. After that, number six or whatever it is, you create a new people through education. Because the general will is deduced from a core human nature, what Marx and others later referred to as the, get the phrase, the species essence of man, quote unquote, and because all humans share in this equally, its political expression is also the expression of each, and this is really important, it's the expression of each individual's highest freedom and the, therefore the sole source of their virtue. It is therefore the function of the state to educate the people to see the general will as their own highest freedom and to get them to accept whatever laws are required to fulfill it. Wow. Just stop to think for a moment how different that ambition is from one that you're going to find in any uh, strictly, say, Islamic society. Uh, in our society, we believe that people have freedom and rights. Canada's charter is called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. <laughs> I'm just already, I'm just right writing an article on, on that whole topic for Epoch Times newspaper. It's got me going so deeply into all this. It's just fascinating, but it's a lot of work. At any rate, um, educating the people to see the general will uh, was the big deal. And as I say, in an Islamic society, it's not a big deal because in a true Islamic society, they will, you know, Islam means submission. That's, that's what it means in English. Islam means submission. Submission to what? <laughs> to, the, to the rule and the rights of God. 
Humans do not have rights under Islam. They only have duties. They only have obligations. Only God has rights. Wow. I mean, just think for a moment what different kinds of civilization arise from those two convictions. In the um, Western world, it's been precisely the opposite. Uh, even in the 16th century, I think, is where you first find the phrase, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Well, that was considered almost a sacred statement then, and it still is by a lot of Democrats. But when an Islamic philosopher or believer hears that, the voice of the people is the voice of God, please, such blasphemy. How can you say such a thing? You know, burn him, hang him, torture him, whatever it comes to mind. But um, it cannot be. It cannot be under Islamic society. And that's why Islamic societies believe that all democratic nations have got off on the wrong foot, totally on the wrong foot, for reasons that I'm mentioning here. You can see why they, they think that. Yet that's the foot that we're on. So if we're on that foot, let's follow it to its conclusions. After educating these people, the, the people, about the general will, as their highest freedom, we go to the next step, which is to resist half solutions and all compromise. So total democracy must resist and defeat all particular individual wills and social interests that compete with the general will. So Rousseau complained about Western societies ever since the birth of Christianity. He said, it was his phrase, we have two heads of the eagle. Well, the eagle was the symbol of power. And the eagle in the Western Christian world had two heads, the spiritual head, like the Pope, whatever, and the political head, like the monarch or whatever else took his, his place after he lost his head. You see, two heads of the eagle. So Western man had a bifurcated dualistic nature. He was not only a citizen civilly in his community and in his village and in his city, whatever, but he was a member of the state, which gave him another personality. Okay, and here what we have is a kind of a pulling power of uh, political philosophy as powerfully expressed by Rousseau, by the way. I think dangerously and mistakenly, but it was, there's no question that the guy was, was a hell of a writer, you know, powerful writer. He had all of your, he had all of Europe at his feet when he wrote his novel like Julie and when he, uh, and when he wrote his Emile about the education of a child. He had people crying all over Europe about the characters in his novels. I think his novel Julie, which is the arch romantic novel of the West really in the time, went into, listen to this, 150 printings. <laughs> it's unbelievable. My first book went into eight printings, and I thought that was pretty good. Rousseau's most important novel went into 150 printings. People, as I say, with uh, Kleenex, whatever, mopping their eyes all over Europe when they read his his words. He was, he was a beautiful and a very thoughtful writer, who I think happened to be on the wrong track, as, as, as I point out here. So, the, so you resist top solutions and you resist <clears throat> all compromise. Because if you have an absolute answer to a question, why would you want a half solution or a compromise? Now, think about that. What is the history of liberal democracy in the West? It's compromise. Years ago, I went out to lunch with a uh, with uh, Frank Stronach. Frank Stronach is an Austrian who came to Canada, got into the automotive business, fascinating fellow, and became one of the richest men anywhere because he created this company called Magna, now called Magna International. They basically make parts for automobiles all over the world and a lot of other things they do too. So the guy's just rolling in it. And one day he called me up and invited me to lunch because he read my first book, The Trouble with Democracy. I think I mentioned this before in one of our other lectures, but I'll say it again. It was quite fascinating because here I was face to face with a European thinker, uh, you know, somewhat in the Rousseauistic vein, I have to say, 
which if I told him person to person, then I could call him up and do that. But I don't think I'm gonna, going to. Uh, he trotted out line for line what Rousseau would have said about liberal democracy. He pulled out a big sheet of yellow paper and a big red pen, and he started sketching for me how he thought liberal democracy, parliamentary democracy, as we have in Canada, should be working. Listen, he said, it's nonsense. Everybody's fighting. All these parties come into Parliament. Canada's got about five or six of them. I don't know, only two or three important ones. Uh, unfortunately, we have that many <laughs> because uh, when you have more than two parties, which tend to want to be different from each other as possible, like in America, when you have more than two, like Canada, they all want to be the same. So they're all hugging the middle and they're trying to attract your vote with the least possible difference between themselves and the other parties because they're afraid if they're too different, they might just get dumped. Anyway, that's the way the social dynamic of voting works here in three party states or more parties. So Frank had the experience, especially with the um, um, Austrian and German situation between the wars, Weimar Republic and all that. Uh, he was familiar with squabbling democratic parties who would come into parliament and fight over what the law should be and nothing ever got done. <clears throat> so he said, that's not the way it should run. The way it should run is, <clears throat> excuse me, each party should come to parliament, give them two days to discuss the issue and then tell them to come back the next day with their solution. So everybody would come back the next day and I guess put their, write out their, the, their solution, the law as they thought it should be. <clears throat> and, you know, put it in a hat or whatever. And on the third day, he said Parliament would read all these solutions from each party and vote for the best one. No more discussion. <laughs> and I said, Frank, the problem with what you're saying is that the best things that have come out of liberal democracy, and there are many, um, have come out of um, discussion. And in your system, there's no discussion. There's just absolute statements about what the law should be. But when two people get together and have a serious discussion about a complicated matter, they usually end up agreeing on something that neither one of them brought to the table in the first place. And they shake hands because, okay, you could say they're equally unhappy when they leave the table, if you want, but they're not unequally unhappy. It's something they agree on or they're equally happy about it, but it's a compromise. And that's that has been the very best of liberal democracy. But you can see how that idea does not fit with what I'm uh, speaking about here, it does not fit with the idea of totalitarian democracy. So this item, the stage of the process is resisting half solutions and all compromise should scare the dickens out of anybody from our tradition. Total democracy must resist and defeat all particular individual or social interests that compete with the general will. Hence, any liberal concepts that counsel a balancing, quote unquote, or a checking of opposing legislative, executive or judicial powers and interests by way of the Republican or the federal type of governments are deemed mere half solutions. Imperfect systems obviously, get this, obviously contrary to pure reason because by institutionalizing discord, they legitimize faction as a solution to faction, and thus they cannot produce true harmony. What is true harmony? Well, symbolically, it's, it's natural man in the Garden of Eden before the fall. So you see, if you skip back here, what Rousseau was getting at and what totalitarian Democrats are getting at is man in his purest condition before sin. You <laughs> see, and what the liberal democracies have been dealing with is man in his impure condition after sinning, symbolically speaking. That's the kind of system that we have. So the next step in this process here is you establish freedom as a form of control. Movements for collective freedom tend to become movements for radical control of how that freedom is used and expressed. And that is because freedom must be embodied only in positive enactments of the state for the greatest good of all. <clears throat> Marx and the Soviets called this social freedom. Uh, and we'll get this. By the way, that's a phrase that Edmund Burke used too, but in a very different way. 
So we'll get to that when I get to my little talk on Marx for you, which is really, I hate to use the phrase mind-blowing. It's a terrible expression. It's not even mind-blowing up, you know. But um, it, it is a, a surprising uh, take on what Marx was doing, who thought of his Marxism as the purest form of democracy. That's an insulting thing to say for anyone who recognizes the, the terrible slaughters brought about by the communist systems of the world everywhere. But at any rate, um, okay, so I said, I'll, I'll start over. <laughs> These were movement, you need movements for collective freedom, and they tend to become movements for radical control of how that freedom is used and expressed. That is because freedom must be embodied only in positive enactments of the state for the greatest good of all. Marx and the Soviets called this social freedom. It raises the need for a series of enumerated rights, duties, and social and economic benefits, including prescriptions for correct behavior and correct thought. It's a little bit scary, I think, that in our time, and this, and this is a phrase which simply did not exist in the middle of the last century, even up till the 1980s, political correctness. That phrase is everywhere now. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that Marx and all his people were getting at, political correctness. So correct behavior and thought, controlled by the few in the name of the many. This transformation is inevitable because once freedom and equality are declared core public goods, they must be expressed correctly, rationed and controlled by a single authority, just like any other public good, <laughs> medicine, you know, free medicine, or whatever it is you're giving to your people, uh, supposedly for free, um, has to be rationed by some authority. Uh, same with freedom. It is no surprise that Robespierre <clears throat> the keenest defender of freedom of the press before the French Revolution immediately became the keenest defender of censorship once his democratic regime seized power. So he was all for free expression when he was fighting the system. But once he got into power, <laughs> his democratic regime got into power, he shut down all, all objections uh, to it. He saw and he saw both these actions as freedom, the freedom to complain about injustice before democracy was installed was the same to him as the freedom to protect democracy <clears throat> by restricting any democratic speech afterwards. <clears throat> by the way, this is not far from what Mark Hughes called repressive tolerance in the 60s of the last century. He spoke of repressive tolerance. <clears throat> Excuse me, repression was all right if you're repressing for a good motive, but not if you aren't. Crazy. So the next step is, and this is one which really gets my dander going, you dissolve civil society. The autonomous individual must be considered the foundational political and social unit of egalitarian society. An individual with a serial number, <clears throat> a retinal screen, or a fingerprint is the starting point in establishing uniformity. <coughs> Excuse me. Because logically, all units must, must by right, be equally free, then obviously the powerful differentiating, quote, intermediate associations, unquote, of civil society um, <clears throat> are soon identified as hostile because they compete for the loyalty of the citizen and thus cannot be tolerated by the government. Civil society must be dissolved <clears throat> into the state because all social groups, including political parties, are deemed mere expressions of particular wills. <clears throat> and removing all competition for state loyalty is the basic motive for the attack on traditional society, especially on the biologically and sexually based Natural family. Oh boy, there's a ton can in you, that paragraph. Yep. William, yeah. can you do me a favor and ex explain again the last uh, um, paragraph? Like, break it down a little more for us. Yeah. Well, starting with the autonomous individual, uh, and don't forget that was the bottom level of the political sandwich here. 
whose form of power is self-control, must be considered the foundational political and social unit of egalitarian society. <clears throat> now, the individual, until all this totalitarian thinking came along, was considered only the foundational social unit, not the foundational political unit. But once you get into this idea of the general will, you have to you have to dissolve civil society uh, because otherwise people have two personalities. They have a civil personality and a political personality, and they're always going to be opposed to each other. So you have to get rid of the civil personality. That's what the paragraph is about and what Rousseau was about in constructing the idea of the general will is you outlaw <clears throat> all free associations in civil society and you pull the free citizens into allegiance <clears throat> to a single political idea, which he happened to call the general will. And so that's why to the state, the most important things are an individual with a serial number or a retinal screen or a, what they call an arthrit, a radio frequency uh, device, which helps them to monitor where everybody is and what they're doing. I mean, China's already there in its own way, as I understand it. They have some kind of social rating system which shows up on your phone, you know, and you're going to get finger wagging scolding from the state if you go too far here or too far there in your behavior. So, um, so because logically all units of the state, which is ind individuals, must by right be equally free, then obviously the powerful differentiating intermediate associations of civil society are soon identified as hostile. The family is the key amongst these, by the way. And that's why uh, totalitarian thinkers always talk about the state as one big family because they're bringing in programs <clears throat> to reduce, if not completely eliminate, the effects of the traditional family. That's why you have things like state daycare, state housing for young married couples. Why in uh, housing put together in Sweden, for example, for young married couples, there's no, there's no dining room in the apartments that they rent to these people. They all have to go to a common dining room. That's a way of obliterating the vertical effects of the family on their own members and replacing them. In other words, you displace, you displace and then you replace. And that's what the state does. In the common dining room, you've replaced family values, family traditions, family discussion, and privacy and all that with a public open format of public discussion, public eating, public whatever it is you're doing in the dining room. You see, it's, uh, it's part of the fight against uh, civil society conceived of as what Edmund Burke called the little platoons, which actually are the most important aspect of all to me, and certainly they were to him. So this is a struggle for loyalty. It's a competition for the loyalty of the citizen. And see, and so these intermediate associations are called between the state and the individual. They cannot be tolerated. So in Rousseau's social contract, he basically outlawed them. He said they have to go down. They have to be shot down and gotten rid of. Um, and they must be dissolved into the state because all social groups, including political parties, by the way, um, are deemed mere expressions of particular wills of their members. We don't want particular wills under the general will. We abolish all that. Okay, so removing all competition for state loyalty is the basic motive for the attack on traditional society and especially on the biologically and sexually based natural family. Look at what's going on today. Look at this revolt against natural gender. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. And, and it's just so hard for me to believe. Last night I was watching some news program and uh, some fellow came on interviewing uh, Bruce Jenner. I don't know if you know who Bruce Jenner was, but he was a fabulous decathlete who competed, won the gold medal in the Montreal Olympic Games, where I was a part-time commentator for Canada's national television station. It was just something I did for fun because I was formerly a decathlon man myself. They asked me to do what they call the color commentary on the decathlon, so I did. And here was this strapping, tough, vital, <laughs> strong, accomplished decathlete going through his 10 events and so on named Bruce Jenner. And nobody got such a shock as me when, what is it, you know, 40 years later or more, you know, that was 76. So, yeah, 40, more than 40 years later. 
Bruce Jenner decides that he's a woman. So he puts on lipstick, he grows his hair long, changes his voice, I don't know, and all that kind of thing. And he comes on TV, drawling, drawling away like he's a woman. Okay, <laughs> I can leave him alone. I don't have to tear off his clothes and make him put on a lumberjack shirt and a pair of pants or any of that. But what I really object to is the TV commentator referring to him as she. Now, he can refer to himself as she all he wants. I don't know why we don't lock him up. Because if he walked around referring to himself as Napoleon, you know, or um, Charles de Gaulle, <laughs> or the Prime Minister of Canada, whatever, we'd probably think seriously that he needed some <laughs> some um, psychiatric assistance. But instead, we don't even yawn. The commentator, the interviewer, was re referring to a machine on her. And to me, that's a capitulation of our media to the demands of the will of people who say that they're uncomfortable in their own body, so they want to be someone else. I'm sorry they're uncomfortable, really. It's, I'm empathetic to that if they really feel uncomfortable. But uh, I don't think the state or its organs, like the CBC in Canada, should be coming on site, because we wouldn't. If you said he was Jesus Christ or Louis Napoleon, we would not call him Louis, and we would not call him the Lord. So why do we do it when he calls himself a woman, like change his name to Caitlyn Jenner? I don't know. I can't explain it. Except to me, this is part of the slow capitulation of free civil societies and all that they stand for and that they stand on uh, to uh, modern ideological precepts. Anyway, here we get into the danger territory now. The next stage of this, after dissolving civil society in this way, is identifying the enemies of the people. So once things have progressed this far, totalitarian democracy requires it requires a strict insider-outsider psychology. <clears throat> the people, quote-unquote, are soon identified as only those who agree to fuse their will, their particular will, with the general will. And they are set in opposition to all who stubbornly cling to social or religious or family loyalties and who thereby define them and they are and they thereby define themselves listen to this as internal enemies of the state in the french revolution the only true citizens were those quote who were spiritually identified with the substance get the word with the substance that constituted french nationhood the general will. Talmud calls that the substance that constituted French nation that was the general will. In his famous catechism, Rousseau wrote a kind of book called the Catechism. Robus, I didn't, I said Rousseau, I meant Robespierre. Robespierre's answer to the question, <laughs> listen carefully, who are the enemies? Was this, quote, the vicious and the rich, who are the same, unquote. So first he guillotined the aristocrat, and eventually he guillotined the baker who dared to sell the aristocrat his bread. A bit further on, we will see how such ideological thinking has led to the horrifying slaughter of full citizens by their own governments in very recent times. The French Revolution was just the first political instance of the modern trend to murder full citizens in the name of freedom. I stand by that statement. They're being murdered in the name of a particular kind of freedom. Quite aware of this paradox, Robespierre <coughs> referred to all of these actions as, quote, the despotism of freedom against tyranny. So he knew it was despotism. But it was against tyranny, and uh, so it was okay. And the French deputies in their legislator, legislature, <clears throat> they just soaked it all up. Next stage, you condemn all social and material inequality. So here's where, because all individuals are now part of the general will, part of the substance of the state, <clears throat> and they're all equal in their freedom, 
they also have to be equal in everything else. Early theorists of the French Revolution initially accepted, even defended, the right to private property at first. And hence, they accepted the natural, natural inequality that this engendered. But in the revolution's more fanatical second phase, influential radical uh, Democrats, such as Gracchus Babeuf, a real troublemaker, argued that unequal classes and incomes and land holdings and privileges were to be condemned as part of the exploitative and oppressive plot. He called it a plot of a corrupt society to block the natural equality of the people in the state of nature. William, See? it's incredible. It's like uh, communism before Marx, Marxism before Marx. Oh, totally. Oh, 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 totally. And by the way, there's a book written. I can't remember his name there. Cheshire. You see, at 82, I still have a memory. The guy's name was Renal Cheshire, S-E-C-H-E-R. Your people should remember this and go look for it. It's still available in a reprint. I don't remember the title, but Renal Cheshire wrote a book about the horrors of the French Revolution. And um, I've only read excerpts from it, <laughs> but uh, it's just astonishing. There isn't anything that the German Nazis did in the Second World War or that the Russians did in their subsequent totalitarian democracy called communism or that the uh, Pol Pot and all these communists did. There isn't anything those people did that wasn't first done by the French, including pulling teeth out of people's mouths, gold teeth, uh, making lampskins out of human skin, lampshades out of human skin, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was terrible. Do we have any indication, because I'm not aware of, of such, uh, of how many people were murdered during the French uh, Revolution? Estimates go up to 250,000. Estimates go as low as 150,000. I don't know. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but it's not small. And uh, critiques of this have finally come out. There was a distinguished uh, French historian, I think he's still alive, named Francois Furet, F U. R-E-T. Uh, he wrote a book in the 1980s when the French were closing in on their bicentenary. The release was timed for that reason because they were all getting excited about celebrating, you know, uh, the French Revolution uh, and its little slogan about uh, freedom and equality and all that kind of stuff. Um, he, his book came out. It was called Pensez la, la Revolution Française. So rethinking the French Revolution. And it was a direct attack on the Marxist or communist historians who had held the historical field on this for years and who had been arguing, oh my goodness, for more than half a century, maybe for a whole century, had been arguing that the uh, uh, French Revolution got off track, that when it, be, when it mutated into the, what's called the terror, in 1792 and so on. You had a couple of years of rank killing terror there, murder in the name of freedom, liberty. Um, that that was a, a mistake, that it was the revolution getting off track. When Furet's book came out, he argued, no, it wasn't a mistake. It was actually a conclusion of the, of the very principle that I'm reading to you here. It was a natural conclusion of these very principles You had to murder in the name of liberty for the reasons that I'm giving you here. Uh, and that's what the French did. And he said, not only that, but although they supposedly started by objecting to the presence of a monarch in their midst, like a sovereign embodied in one person, right, that they ended up with another sovereign called Louis Napoleon, who happened to be a, uh, a different kind of sovereign, the sovereign of the people. But he had absolute rule. There was no democracy there when Napoleon came to power. It was a dictatorship. And this was the natural outcome of the thinking behind the French Revolution. And that was his warning in his book, Pensez la Révolution Française. So there's been quite a few studies like that since which have backed them up. The most recent one, which I read in French, is called Croix ou Meurs. So it, the title is basically Believe or Die. So... Boy, that was pretty pretty blunt capitulation 
of what was going on in the French Revolution. You either believe what we're telling you and you come on board or you're going to die. So there was there was objection in France in the Vendée region of France called La Vendée, V-E-N-D-E-E. -E. There was a big revolution against um, the revolution uh, in the name of what? Civil society, the family. They didn't buy it. And so the government sent troops in there. And I've seen I've seen estimates, as I said, very high numbers up in the hundred thousand range where they went in and basically condemned and slaughtered their own citizens because they were disbelievers in the French Revolution. The Vendée they, were like uh, Catholics, right? In, in the south of yeah. France, I believe? Yeah, the, the Vendée, I forget exactly where it is. I should know, but I don't. Uh, yeah. But the southwest of France. And thank in, you, the thank book, you. in the book, Qua Humeus, he talks about the Vendée Revolution. And you can find it online. You can Google for it where you will see different estimates. But it was a bloody slaughter, I can tell you that. And a cruel slaughter. Um, they, they, they weren't nice. There was something they called the revolutionary marriage where they would round up people, uh, round up people that they were fighting the revolution and they would strip them naked. So all these naked people, they would put them on a barge in the river. I can't remember which river. <laughs> Probably they did it in the river Seine too. They put hundreds of people on this barge and they'd lash them together stark naked with ropes like a guy and a girl. A man and a woman would be lashed together face to face, stark naked with ropes tightly. They called this the revolutionary marriage. And then they would sink the barge and hundreds of people would be drowned at once. You know, if you want to look for pertinent historical examples of efficiency in killing, go to the French. Because as I say, the Germans were terrible and so were the Russians. But there's nothing they did that, that the French didn't do first. William, I have a, a silly question, but it's something that we are researching in this group lately. Uh, in your research of the French Revolution, did you encounter among the leaders and the philosophers and the, the pushers of uh, what happened there any kind of Jewish leadership? Um, <clears throat> I think I did. I just can't recall who, though. But I'll get back to you and I'll let you know. Thank you. I, I, I think I did. Now, it's interesting because... Um, It just so happens that historically, a lot of the communist le people who brought communists about in Europe were Jewish oh, yes. political Jewish political thinkers. Absolutely, yes. Unbelievable numbers of them. Eighty-five percent, according to what I I learned from when the, the way, the, when the population of the the Jews in Russia was apparently maybe one percent or one point five percent, the leaders of the Bolshevik uh, were about eighty-five percent, and they were responsible for. Yeah. And, no, and nobody ta yeah, nobody talks about that. It's almost like a taboo subject, <clears throat> but it's very true. I've noticed it all my life. And in America, by the way, it was the same. In the American Revolution of the 60s, so to speak, the Students for a Democratic Society and all that kind of group, uh, a lot of Jewish uh, students were again, up, again, there with, please, up, there, sorry. up there with the, mic yeah, up there with I, the microphone. No, no, I'm sorry. I missed you. When, when, when? In the, in the 60s and 70s, the student revolutions in the U.S., Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there was an organization called SDS, which meant Students for a Democratic Society. I knew some of them. They were running on the track team with me, and I used to tell them they were crazy. And this was one of the guys who I told you already, I think, in one of our talks. I said, what are you doing after the workout today? Oh, he said, I'm going over to the uh, grocery store to steal a steak from Safeway. Safeway is a big grocery chain in America, very big, national. I said, you're what? He said, I'm going to Safeway to steal a steak. I, I want. I need to have some dinner. I said, Del, I said, his name was Del Martin. I said, Del, what are you doing? Uh, he was a member of SDS. He said, look, they're, they're stealing from us. I'm just taking it back. All these, corporations, all these corporations, they're just thieves, is what his argument was. <clears throat> Yes, I understand. It was a scary, um, world, a scary world. <clears throat> when when we look today, I think we can see that all the decadence and degradation of society is being uh, managed and perpetuated. Uh, how do you say it? Like perpetu um, perpetuated? Yes, perpetuated by different Jewish institutions and Jewish thinkers, uh, for, you know, ranging from feminism to porno to LGBT to any. I mean, they are overly represented. And 
there. It's, it's really scary. Honestly, he, he, I agree with you, hugely so. <clears throat> and I haven't heard anyone else say that except you and me. Uh, hugely so. The same is true with feminism in America. A lot of Jewish authors, Jewish writers. Uh, the same in uh, France. Look at Jean Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, he was a Jewish intellectual and so on and so on. Um, very influential people. You know, someone <laughs> told me once, <clears throat> one of my best friends is Jewish and uh, a very articulate articulate uh, fellow. <laughs> and I told him, I said, Lowell, I said, the Jews, the Jews' best weapon is his mouth. <laughs> Meaning, somehow these people, these agitators are so articulate and expressive that they end up with a bloody microphone <laughs> in these revolutionary movements. Plus, you know, but, they're smart. But, you know, I wonder, and I'm sorry that I'm diverting the conversation a little bit, but it's important to me uh, and to the group to hear your opinion. It, I, it's very hard for me to recognize what is the force that influenced those kind of Jews. Like, what is, are they doing that because they're Jews? Are, are they doing it because they're psych psychopaths? I mean, it seems like they are mostly on the left. They are very secular. But uh, when you investigate a little more, you can find a lot of uh, background from rabbinical system. Uh, the orthodox system, but it's very confusing. I can't really say what is the motivation they have. Maybe you well, know. I, I like to answer you by saying something self-promotional, which I hope you'll excuse me for. I'd love you to read this book because the whole first part of the book is about uh, messi messianism or millenarianism. And I would say at the root of the Jewish religion is the expectation that Christ will come. The Messiah is going to appear. Uh, the whole form of, of uh, Jewish uh, religious thinking has to do with this uh, future state of perfection, which, of course, we also have in Christianity. You know, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy kingdom come. It's not here yet. Now, some Christians will say it is here. It came here when Christ arrived. The kingdom's already here. Well, I'm not going to argue all that. He get into big, big intellectual knots when you start going around with these people. But I'm saying at the heart of the Christian religion and of Jewish messianism is this idea that perfection uh, is to come. And now, um, what kind of perfection? Well, it's been secularized. So when you get secularized messianism, you get communism and national socialism and um, uh, other kinds of socialism, such as we have in Canada, they're all what I call expectational visions for the progressive perfection of human societies. Now, this is intolerable to, say, a, a, a true Christian who would say man is imperfect. You can't. You, we were flawed by nature. The first flaw came in the Garden of Eden. If you want to talk theology, it came in the Garden of Eden, the apple and all the rest of it. Man is a fallen species. We are imperfect by nature. And ipso facto, whatever the expression is, if you follow that line of thinking, how can you have a perfect state or a perfect government if it's made by imperfect man? Well, obviously you can't. Imperfect man can only make imperfect things. So you're going to be stuck with imperfection forever if that theory is true. But people who have the other side of the equation, they believe that, it can be made perfect. And I think that if you read this book, you'll see the whole Gnostic spirit runs all through this. And uh, Jewish Gnosticism, Christian millenarianism, it's all explained in this book. And we're probably not going to talk about it on these shows because it gets awfully complicated. But I think I've made it as clear as possible in, in the book. And you're talking about the first book, The Trouble with Democracy. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, this, this wow. book it wasn't, it wasn't my first book. <laughs> I'm so yes. excited reading it. Thank you. Uh, I, hope, yeah, I, let's... You know, I hope you'll enjoy it. There may be parts where you say, let's talk about it, in which case I'm I'm happy to do that. Definitely. And I wonder if I should, I should get back to this bit now. Yes, please. Let's about go back. How condemn, condemning all social and material inequality for the same reasons, you see. And that's what all those Jewish political thinkers were doing at the before and after the turn of the century. They were preaching... Uh, mass equality, you know, the goodness of mass equality. So, uh, as I say, in the early in the French Revolution, they accepted the rights to private property, but it gradually changed under the influence of some of their thinkers, like the Abbe C.A.S. and Gracchus Brebeuf. These were huge uh, figures in the development of the uh, fr fr French Revolution. Um, 
influential radical Democrats, so to speak. And so they saw it all, all the land holdings and the unequal classes and the un unequal incomes, the merit system, if you like, <clears throat> as part of an exploitative and oppressive plot of a corrupt society to block the natural equality of the people in the state of nature. So there you have it, the state of nature, Garden of Eden and so on, you know. There is a deep anti-capitalist sentiment here, which is a forerunner of Marxist communism. To ensure that any such plot is blocked, the state, which defends the general will, must control all economic life. So you can see the logic of how this gets to controlling all economic life and dissolve all competing private economic interests. Now, once this logic begins, the use of money for personal gain becomes intolerable, becomes a sign of anti-revolutionary activity. The equality postulate, as I call it, then leads to the conviction that no one can be allowed to own more than any other person, or else the idea of the equality of votes, of votes, becomes a mockery of democracy, right? This is the chain of logic that turns Democrats into communists. Any wealth above the average becomes defined as theft from the common pool of humanity. In the end, a three-way equation joined virtue, democracy, and communism all in one package. For it was eventually argued that only a perfect equality in all things could produce a perfect democratic sovereignty of the common people. Once equality replaces liberty as a standard of justice, however, this logic cannot be escaped. And I would say that's what's happened in all the, I do say that in all the democratic states of the modern world. They have gotten themselves into trouble. They began in a foundation of liberty, but they gradually saw after a century or so <clears throat> that liberty wasn't doing the job. It was producing an underclass of very unequal citizens who were embarrassing the overclasses, so to speak, sleeping and pooping in the streets, living in ragged old tents in the rain and the cold winters and so on. We don't have a lot of this in Canada, but these some, and you can see a hell of a lot of it, a lot of it in America, where what I'm talking about is becoming manifest. This got the democracies into big trouble. Um, and so what they had to do was come up with an alternative foundation which was contradictory to the first one. The first foundation was liberty. The second foundation was the new foundation was equality. Well, you can't put those two foundations together and expect to get a thriving polity. So faced with the contradiction, what these modern democracies, and they've all done it, is they split the body politic into two bodies, a private body and a public body. I've said this before. What's the private body all about? You know, Marijuana rights, homosexual rights, um, alcohol rights, whatever, um, easy marriage, easy divorce, uh, just all, all kinds of things which used to be difficult of attainment are now given to individuals very freely. So we have we are libertarians in our individual person and we are socialists nationally. That's certainly the case with Canada. Medical care is nationalized in Canada. Right. If you actually if you're a doctor and you actually try to give a patient private medical care, which is competitive with the government's uh, listed services, uh, you can be fined and or go to jail. Canada is the only country in the world that's ever done that. Even the former Soviet Union didn't do it. They had various kinds of private care alongside the state system. At any rate, uh, once equality replaces liberty, uh, as opposed as distinct from being alongside it. And I think in the Western democr democracies, the equality idea is gradually smothering the, the liberal idea, except in so far as we have divided the body politic into those two bodies. So there's lots of people walking around countries like Canada, and I'm sure uh, like France, Germany, whatever, who are quite happy because they can do things their parents never dreamed of sexually and in terms of drugs and you know, they can actually have children without getting married and do all kinds of things like that, uh, which their their forefathers couldn't do. And so they feel free as, as a bird. Uh, but they don't even think about the extent to which the government has intruded into their private lives, their corporate lives, and their economic life. 
in Canada, what we call Tax Freedom Day, which is the first day, the first day you, you begin working for yourself instead of for the government, is the first part of June or the end of May. So for five months of the year, every Canadian on average is working for the state. None of that income is going into his pocket. I mean, I'm speaking figuratively because, of course, they take it every month. But figuratively speaking, all that income um, is going to paying for government until the end of May, first, first part of June. Well, what are we going to do when it becomes August or September and so on? That has happened in certain countries in the world in history. So anyway, that's the what I call the mutation. Don't call it anything else. It's a mutation. It's not a it's not a transformation. It's a mutation of a of an original concept into its contrary. And we've reacted by splitting the body politic, as I said. Anyway, all this becomes a call for rational and progressive government. You're asking about that. Once any civil society is successfully dissolved or atomized, which means it's broken down from its social molecule into atoms, individual atoms, and then it's reconstituted as a collection of equal and autonomous individuals formed into a single body and a single will, it becomes for the first time amenable to rational planning and social engineering. Planners may now achieve the longed for harmony and freedom, simply not possible in a traditional liberal society that suffers from deep inequities and self-contradiction, the way they see it anyway. Gleaming limousines gliding past homeless beggars on the street gives us the image. A fully rationalized democratic society is, le- is thus inevitably revolutionary and it strives ceaselessly towards its own ideological good as supposedly decided by the unlimited sovereignty of the whole people. This is what supposedly gives it its legitimacy. The whole people did it. That's why we're the way we are. The general will has been ascertained and everybody participates in the general will. Therefore, it's good. Morally good is, is what they rationalize. So um, by combining reason in the form of logical planning with the ideal of inherent goodness, the perfect society can be created. This is a response to your question about why so many of these intellectuals, in, the, in your example, Jewish intellectuals, uh, were pushing for social perfection. You see, uh, by combining reason in the form of logical planning with the ideal of inherent goodness, which is completely anti-Christian ideal, by the way, the perfect society can be created. So this releases social planners and revolutionaries and so-called progressive today to change everything, turn society upside down, trash what we have and create a better world. And once that once that kind of logic gets into any society, you got a disaster, a slow disaster on your hands, in some cases, a fast disaster. Such democratic movements, and that's what they are, are radically opposed to the Christian view that man is by nature fallen and corrupt. And therefore, just as logically, the planners, too, will inevitably be, be corrupt. <laughs> you, see the, you see the circle here. Robespierre was, again, the prototype. He began almost every speech with the advice that as there could be only one morality and one national conscience, his own opinion, as the voice of the assembly, embodied both. So his own opinion embodied both of those forms of morality. Uh, One morality and one national conscience. By implication, All who disagreed, and especially those who were indifferent, branded themselves as enemies of the state. Now, this is where you better run. You better grab your passport, if you still have one, and get the hell out of the country. And by the way, that's what a lot of um, intellectuals, among the many, many Jewish intellectuals did um, before the Nazis took control of many of those European countries, like like France and uh, Portugal and whatever. They got out, and there's a famous, he's dead now, but a famous 
a Jewish historian named Raoul Hilberg, who wrote an equally famous book about the extermination of the European Jews. In his own book, he writes that no one really knows how many Jewish people there were in Europe when Hitler came straight into power, uh, like full power, because so many had left and no one was tracking how many hundreds of thousands or maybe millions had already left Europe. You know? So a lot of the numbers, he said, about the war, the Holocaust, and so on were symbolic because there's no actuarial accounting uh, for it. At any rate, the next stage for this is you substitute the enlightened few for the many. The French Jacobin type of, quote, democratic perfectionism, unquote, became what Talman described as a kind of inverted totalitarianism based on the fanatical belief that there could be only one legitimate popular will. The Constitution of 1793 offered plebiscitary approval of all legislation, made possible the recall of deputies for any reason, and it encouraged countless depositions, protests, and petitions in the search for the transparent general will. This perfectionism on the ground <clears throat> was bound to lead straight to anarchy, for in practice, only a very small portion of the people, one-fifth of them, actually voted. We know that. Hence, a small group of elite insiders quickly constituted themselves as, guess what, interpreters of the general will. They couldn't, they couldn't arrive at it <clears throat> by headcount because only a fifth of the people were voting. And so they interpreted the general will for who? For the good of the whole people, whom, it was said, get this, could not yet see their own good. Once again, substitute judgment emerges as the key technique required for moral and political domination. And substitute judgment, by the way, is what we have in all euthanasia regimes, all abortion regimes, where the judgment of the state or the law, in the case of, if you want to call it that, is substituted for the human being. And decisions are made by substitute judgment. Only by educating the people, and especially by eliminating all evil influences, and that is, all those who disagreed with the assembly, evil influences, could the secret voice of God in the people, meaning what they would say if they only knew better, be heard. Wow, it's amazing. At this point, the general will becomes recast. It is no longer the spontaneous will of all the people, but the will that they ought to express, and therefore that must be imposed on them if they refuse. In this decisive moment, revolution in the name of freedom and virtue turns into absolutism. And now a corrupt society, it is argued, requires a single strong will to establish its dreamland equality by force. The Bonapartism that followed the French Revolution was just an example of this. Napoleon, who declared that he wanted the greatest good for the greatest number, took the attitude, I'm quoting him, I am where I am because I know better than anyone else what is good for the French people, and they know that I know better. Unquote. That's a funny quote, but it's a deadly quote, see? And they know that I know better. They have confidence in me and my judgment. Wow. So getting near the end here, the next stage is you invert freedom. You claim that the whole <clears throat> or the political state comes before the parts or before civil society. At a critical, critical stage in the evolution of totalitarian democracy, freedom is no longer thought of as individual or societal independence, but as a definable set of objective and elusive state values to which all must, must adhere. In essence, under a direct dem democratic theory, the parts are supposed to form the whole in a bottom-up fashion. But at the totalitarian crisis point, which I'm explaining here, this is turned upside down. And the idea of the whole as the unified people 
within the political state begins to control the parts in a top-down fashion. Boy. Next part of the process, which you can see I have broken down a lot, you invoke a what I call a means and override. So means and ends are different. I have means slash end and override. There comes a crucial day in all revolutions, even those founded on the ideas of peace and freedom, when an elite decides that violent action in the pursuit of peaceful objectives is temporarily justified. In the English Puritan Revolution of the 17th century, for example, Oliver Cromwell assembled a <coughs> kangaroo court, basically is what it was, that tried King Charles I <coughs> and summarily beheaded him in the name of what? Of the people. But this court, quote unquote, knew that the people themselves, had they been asked, would have voted to spare the king's life. But they weren't asked. So it invoked the psychology of what I call the means and override of the people's actual will and substituted for it something it obviously deemed, listen to this, was the people's higher will or their real will, which they could not yet see for themselves. In the same way, Louis-Antoine Saint-Just knew that an appeal to the French people to decide the fate of their own doomed King Louis XVI in the French Revolution would be tantamount to a continuation of the monarchy. So contrary to the popular will, but, but on behalf of the people, the French assembly voted by a very narrow margin to execute him. In both cases, the revolutionists wanted the people to speak, but only in a politically acceptable manner. Finally, you establish an eschatology, or the myth of a final solution. Terrible words, <laughs> for a reason that we know. This brings us to political messianism, which Harry, you and I were just discussing. <clears throat> the view that there is a, quote, a preordained, harmonious, and perfect scheme of things to which men are irresistibly driven and at which they are bound to arrive, unquote. That's a quote from Talmud. This scheme is assumed to be the perfect democracy, producing a perfect transparency, perfect laws, and perfect communication of the rational popular will in a society of equally free human beings. So you can see all the social engineering <clears throat> that brought them to this space, so to speak. In short, once a de democratic transparency of the people's will is established as the goal, and such instrument as a veto on the assembly, the recall of representatives <clears throat> at any time, plebiscites on any issue, and continuously revocable laws are put in place. And then the stage is set for a totalitarian dictatorship <clears throat> that may use all of these devices to rule. This is probably inevitable simply because whenever there is a competition to engineer referenda, for example, or referendums, as some people call them, for mass public support, and, quote, where full unanimity is postulated, there's no escape from the imposition of a single will, unquote. We saw intimations of this same process in previous chapters of this book, well, which we haven't seen, but... Um, um, where we examine the revolutionary spiritual and political urges expressed by medieval and Reformation sects and religious movements. Most of those sects strove only for personal salvation in a community of faith obedient to God. But modern political religions, in contrast, are distinguished by their dissatisfaction with waiting for otherworldly perfection. They want the secular kingdom of heaven on earth now, by force, if necessary. Clearly then, the idea of democracy as a bottom-up expression of the free will of the people <clears throat> conflicts with the imposition of a top-down vision of a democratic, free, and final social order, whatever that may be. But policy will not wait. It must often be decided by emergency, and hence 
pushed in one direction or another. This means that agreement must be extracted from competing visions of freedom and equality. In this sense, a collectivist regime that justifies itself by democratic theory becomes indistinguishable from any other form of absolutism. Lastly, you define moral and political slavery. Eventually, the entire populace is conceived as either in agreement with the chosen revolutionary ends or it's trapped in a kind of <clears throat> slavery to ignorance. We have seen already how deeply the language of slavery is connected to the language of freedom throughout our history. <clears throat> and there I'm referring to the very first chapter of this book, which is about freedom and democracy and slavery. Indeed, the vanguard elite actually functions just like a spiritual and political elect, bringing the Gnostic light to masses of enslaved and darkened souls willing to receive it and punishing, fining, re-educating, banishing, or eliminating <clears throat> all who resist. Almost finally, you join the law to the state in a government intended perfectly to express the people's will. There is no need for a justice system as we know it. Committees of public safety, that's what it was called in the French Revolution, courts or tribunals need only a code or a charter of the law to judge people as suspect or guilty. But the law itself can never be judged because it's an expression of the general will of the whole people. It can never be wrong. It's always correct, is the thinking. Jacobin justice became exactly such an expression of the fusion of government and law. Modern Canada and the United States have prototypes of this system in the many tribunals that they have set up <clears throat> to adjudicate so-called human rights, such as gay rights, abortion rights, employment rights, and a myriad of other rapidly multiplying rights categories. According to what? To abstract written codes, which say nothing about <laughs> those rights. As such codes cannot be self-interpreting, this inevitably means they will be interpreted according to the values of the judges, generally, who are generally carefully chosen representatives of the elect, and there's no appeal. And then you justify terror. Once we accept the idea of a single democratic vision or virtue styled as the voice of God, violence is easily defended as justice. <clears throat> <clears throat> Robespierre is fascinating. He explained it this way. I'm quoting him. He said, the terror is nothing other than prompt justice, severe and inflexible. It is thus an emanation of virtue. It is less a particular principle than a consequence of a general democratic principle applied to the most pressing needs of the nation, unquote. That's my translation of his French, but I think I'm pretty close. Under such a scheme, the whole idea of parliamentary democracy or Congress that includes an opposition parties, opposition parties is scorned, listen to this, as a celebration of disunity and therefore a logical scandal. Democratic rights can be attained, quote, only after the elimination of all opposition and the complete saturation of the people <clears throat> with communist ideas, unquote. The word elimination here means liquidation. Finally, almost finally, you name a leader savior. Once the structure of insiders versus outsiders of the elect versus the people is established, the charade of a fully democratic process is abandoned <clears throat> as unworkable, sluggish, and premature. A leader savior, or one whose character symbolizes the nation and the revolution, is then required by the urgency of events to decide upon and execute the laws, <laughs> and execute a lot of the people, I should say, who don't agree with those laws. Followers of the movement are now prepared to suspend personal judgment in favor of their leader's judgment. Napoleon's dictatorship was considered by many, listen to this, as the fulfillment of revolutionary democracy. Finally, you establish democracy as a new political religion. 
Professor Talman's description of this process as it occurred <clears throat> during the French Revolution is most telling. For with minimal alteration, it describes all later forms of democracy as well. The combination of the devotion of the faithful and a stringent orthodoxy, he explains, and now I'm quoting him, was a new phenomenon in modern political history. Having started as a movement for popular self-expression and permanent debate to share in joyous communion the experience of exercising popular democracy, Jacobinism soon developed into a confraternity of faithful who must lose their selves. Get this? They must lose their selves in the objective substance of the faith to regain their souls. Submission became, get that word, submission. That's the word we see in Islam today. Submission became in due course release. Obedience was turned into freedom. Membership to the Jacobin Club became the outward sign of belonging to the elect and the pure. Participation in Jacobin feasts and patriotic rites was a religious experience. Secular religion, okay. We remember how during the French Revolution, the Jacobins, the radicals, threw out the altar, threw out the cross in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and they set up a 35-foot papier-mâché statue of the goddess of reason. Now, she was a huge, almost like a huge angel, all white, all thrown together with papier-mâché stuff on a wire frame. And the so-called priests of secular reason would do their little walks or dances around her with their candles, uh, chanting little slogans about the purity of reason and all the rest of it. But in this way, they were trying to de-Christianize France. Because, as I said, the Christian religion was what created the two heads of the eagle, which I'm glad for, because the one head of the eagle, the Christian head, even if you're just a secularized kind of Christian, but you're still following its precepts, is all you have to resist the other eagle of the state and its power. Um, so obedience was turned into freedom. Get it? Had the world upside down. Obedience is freedom. Membership for the Jacobin clubs became the outward sign of belonging to the elect and the pure. Participation in their rites was a religious experience. Inside the clubs, there was going on an unceasing process of self-cleansing and purification, <clears throat> entailing what? Denunciations of non-believers, confessions of one's own failings, excommunications and expulsions, of those who failed to follow the Jacobin faith. It's unbelievable. The dictatorship of the Committee of Public Safety was thus no mere tyranny of a handful of men clinging to power and in possession of all the means of coercion, no mere police system in a beleaguered fortress. It rested on closely knit and highly disciplined cells, kind of like communist cells, and nuclei in every town and village, from the central artery of Paris to the smallest hamlet in the mountains, composed of men only waiting with enthusiastic eagerness for a sign, no more to express their spontaneous urge for freedom, but rather their revolutionary exultation through obedient and fervent execution of orders from the center, the seat of the enlightened and the infallible few, end quote. In this manner, plebiscitary popular sovereignty came to fruition in the totalitarian rule of a tiny fraction of, a, of the nation. And I'm sorry it's so long, but that ends my exposition for today. I'm really excited about getting into all this with Marxism next time to explain how it all ran through. Let's call it the religion of Marxism. And I think your listeners will be interested in hearing how that goes. And the one after that will deal with uh, Hitler and his own personal notion of what he called, quote unquote, true democracy. Well, thank you for having me, Harry. Wow. William, you are relentless. You are a, it's like an ocean of knowledge. Every time you reinvent yourself. I think we had already like what, maybe 15 episodes yes. together? Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, 
of course, I appreciated and loved each one of them, and especially uh, the war against the family, which we, you broke down for us. But uh, tonight it was incredible, incredible. And I recommend uh, your book, your first book, uh, The Trouble with Democracy, for everyone in every house. It's a must. Well, I, I, I support you in that. <laughs> I would love to see it. Believe me, I don't make any money out of this. This book, The Poor Thing, As I say, I think it was my best book and has the deepest thinking I was able to produce and, and kind of aim at this topic. It came into my publisher's warehouse in a transport trailer truck, 3,000 copies of the first printing, the day that he declared bankruptcy. <laughs> and the book, oh, never, it, never, it never got to market. They just sold it like for a dollar a copy to what they call jobbers, people who, who sell it through little bookstores here and there. I don't know. It was never reviewed, never anything. And, and I'm sorry to say, because I think it's really worth uh, reading. And maybe long after I'm gone, it'll make its mark. I'm sure it does already now. Uh, William, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and energy and your willingness to share this uh, very important information with us. And uh, I will be seeing you next Wednesday. Next Wednesday on Marxism. Yes, thank you. So Take I will uh, send you... an email with the um, um, link to the lecture as soon as I prepare it, okay? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye for now.